Okay, so there we go. So once again, good morning. Welcome to uh, screen testing to YouTube. Um, I do this on a daily basis with my classes. I teach physics and computer science. I also teach grade 10 science and I've taught math for a number of years in the past. Uh, sort of run the gamut as most people with over 20 years of experience have done. And really I found that you can pretty much do this in any classroom. Um, so we'll just begin by sort of talking about what is screencasting. Of course, I went to Wikipedia to find my the answer. I knew what it was, but I sort of didn't have a, a, a formal definition. Uh, Wikipedia defines it as digital recording of computer screen output, also known as video screen capture, often containing audio narration. So right now, whatever's being uh, presented on my screen, it's being recorded right here, and the audio is being picked up through the, the laptop microphone. Um, I've gone through a few microphones over the years. I used to wear one sort of uh, around my neck, a USB rechargeable one. I've worn the headset to not much success. Uh, what I use right now is just a plain old web camera and just sort of put it where I sort of tend to stand and it does the trick. Um, if I'm doing a formal sort of one for kids to watch later, if I'm sort of recording it by myself in my room, I'll put a headset on uh, that has a little bit better sound. But for the most part, I just sort of use the web camera kind of thing. So real easy to do, not a lot of uh, expense. Uh, some benefits that I've found over the years that I've been doing, I've probably been doing it now maybe five or six or seven years. Uh, number one, the flipped classroom model. I don't know if you're familiar with that, the idea of having all of the instructional time done on video. Um, my colleague next door, Chris Fisher, does almost, almost all his classes that way. Uh, he creates thousands, and, well, I shouldn't say thousands, but hundreds of podcasts, hundreds of lessons that he's video recorded. Kids uh, watch them at home and then they come to his class for help kind of thing. It works real well with our grade 10 science kids. Um, we've got two um, sessions of grade 10 science. We have uh, regular and we have our enriched. And sometimes when you get an enriched kid in the regular class, you want to give them a little bit of enrichment. Chris throws them on some videos and then they can get sort of that, some of that enrichment that way. So flip classroom model. I use that on my computer science. Oh, yes. And remember to always turn your email off before recording. Because <laughs> you never know what's going to pop up there, right? Um, I use this in my computer science classes. Um, because of the nature of computer science, I get kids that, uh, you know the kids that I'm talking about, uh, the kids that want to learn everything right now, and they just want to go pedal to the metal, 1,000 miles an hour kind of thing. Uh, so I've pretty much got my entire grade 10 computer science class uh, podcasted, recorded. Um, kids can move through that at their own pace. The grade 11 I'm still working on, the grade 12 is sort of another beast because they're all over the place. But uh, currently in my, grade, in my computer science class, I have grade 10, 11, and 12. And Luke, as I like to say, Luke is even beyond the grade 12s. Uh, so it's very handy. The grade tends to sort of sit in their corner. They got their headphones on. They watch the recorded lessons and they move at their own pace. And I don't have to do any sort of standing at the front teaching. I've sort of done it all. I'm certainly there for them to, to ask questions and stuff. But it works really well in that type of situation. Uh, it allows students to catch up on missed lessons. And this was probably my reason for doing this originally. Uh, we all know, especially this winter, we've had kids missing classes left and right kind of thing. Yesterday, my grade 12 physics class, we had no buses running in Mountain View. I had four students show up for my physics class, and I said, guys, I'm going to wait tomorrow. I have to move on. Um, my kids are fairly well trained. I saw a kid later in the day. I said, Liam, I had to move on. He said, no problem. I'll watch the podcast at home tonight. Said, awesome. Um, so I was able to sort of, instead of teaching the lesson today, I was able to actually uh, teach the lesson of the four kids yesterday, recorded the works, Every kid there at school, hopefully today in about an hour or so, will go away and grab a laptop, pop on some earphones, and either watch it themselves individually, maybe watch it on the phone, um, or watch it as a class. I've done that before as well. Taught a lesson, said to the sub, press play. There's the lesson, right? No time loss kind of thing. The thing that I absolutely love the most about all this, without a doubt, is the responsibility is now on the student. When the kid comes to me and says, what did I miss? I say, on YouTube, done. Their responsibility, no longer mine, right? It's no longer, you forgot to hand me this, or you forgot to do this. Uh-uh, your responsibility, it's theirs. Um, and I also love when parents come on parent day, and they say, wait a minute, you're telling me the kids can go back, and all those days they miss, they can watch the lesson? And I say, yes, 
and they usually race home and tell the kid, you're getting on that computer and you're going to watch these lessons kind of So parents love it as well. Quite often I have people stop me in Safeway and Place and say, I was listening to you last night at home. And I hear my voice kind of, I've got, I've got both the voice and the uh, face for radio, I've been told. Um, it allows students to rewatch lessons that they need more help on. If they don't quite get it, they can go home, they can rewatch it kind of thing. Um, you can create tutorials for common mistakes. I'm working on a, uh, with a colleague of mine, a math teacher. He's got five or six lessons that he's put up on YouTube just in the last week or so that we've done. Uh, he says, kids always need help on these. They're always coming to me for help. Can you help me? I said, yeah, let's do this. And so we've created the lessons. They're on his YouTube channel. Uh, kids can go and they can get help on completing the square or factoring or whatever they want. Kind of thing. Uh, exam review. When the kids know, you know, I can't remember how to add vectors, that's a physics term. Uh, I'll say, go find the adding vectors video. It's there, right? They can go, they can re-listen re to it. And I'll say, you know, once you've listened to it, if you still have questions, come to me. But once again, it's that offloading responsibility to, uh, to the students. And interestingly enough, I read an article last night about how um, the, the sort of the main idea that we really need to keep in mind is that we're teaching kids to learn and be responsible. And I thought, wow, that's exactly what I'm doing here is we're teaching them how to learn on their own and then going and get help if they need it, as opposed to coming to me and me trying to remember that 20 minute lesson. Okay, what did I teach this year? Right? How did I show it to, show it this year to the kids? I've even gone, if I've got kids that are going to be away, um, they say, Mr. Man, I'm going to be away for the next two weeks. Can you give me some? I'll, I keep all my old lessons. I throw it on a CD or on a flash drive or bring in their iPod or whatever. And I say, here, here's all the lessons from last year. You watch along. Or if you've got access where you're going, log in at night after that day, and then you'll see the lesson. You'll see exactly the same thing that your, your classmates have seen. So there are tons of benefits, and it really, really is simple. Uh, especially with the bandwidth that we now have. You're going to see how fast this goes up to YouTube. So you're probably asking, what do we need to do this? Um, very little, it turns out, really. Uh, if you're using SmartBoard, you've got recording software. That's what I'm using right now. Okay, so you need some sort of screen recording software, and you need a YouTube account or TeacherTube or another video hosting service, something where you can host the video. Is anyone in a division where they still block YouTube? Perfect. Okay, YouTube's easiest. Kids can see it on their phone. It uploads fast. It's awesome. Okay, so what kind of screen recording software? You may have noticed when I started this, um, I use Smart Recorder. And it comes with smart notebook software. And you'll find it under, if you go over here, I've got it sort of highlighted here for you, but if you go over here, all programs, it's likely, once you start using it, it'll pop up kind of thing, but it's going to be under smart technologies, smart tools, and it's right there, the recorder. It's built in. If you don't have a smart board in your room, no problem. Oh, let me talk more about smart, sorry, first. So some features here. I tried to make that small so it would fit, but now it's hard to read, isn't it? Go away. Okay. Uh, I recommend the standard sound quality. At one time, when bandwidth was an issue, um, file size was an issue, I had to actually reduce my sound quality. I had to reduce my video quality down to one frame per second. But I found lately, no problem at all. We've got a big pipe at home. Uh, YouTube is basically unlimited data storage. At one time, I was storing all my videos to Edline, which was our uh, classroom portal. We're no longer using that now, um, so I can store it to YouTube. So just the standard uh, standard defaults there are just fine. Under the options here, let me just get rid of that. When you go to options up here, uh, I recommend Windows Media Files (WMV). They load nice and quick to YouTube. I click the lower quality, the fast running runs, depending on your bandwidth, you might want to upgrade that. I haven't had any issues where kids say, Mr. Ben, I can't see or I can't hear. So basically the defaults and you're good to go. Okay, so there is other screencasting software. Uh, the first one that popped up when I did a quick Google, because I, to be honest, I don't use them. I use the smart recorder, but um, Screencast-O-Matic. You can, uh, for free, you can record up to 15 minutes. Uh, it also hosts for you up to 15 minutes per upload. It'll record the screen and webcam. 
Smart Recorder doesn't actually do that. They will never see my face on here. You know, sometimes you'll see the videos where the, the presenter's face is sort of in the corner kind of thing. I don't know. I don't really see the need for that. Most of the time, I'm walking around the room anyway, so um, I don't really need to use it. Publish to YouTube and HD, publish to MP4, all these things. Screencast the Matic will work. I've never used it because I don't need to, but it's certainly there. Um, so it's just your voice. You're less familiar with the recording because your voice it's, is not actually video. No, it's it's this video. You're gonna see when we're done here, it's whatever's on the screen. Oh, so the like if yes, sorry. whatever's on the screen, right? So because I teach physics, right, I might be doing a, a sample lesson. So when every time I draw, that's being recorded. Yeah. It's whatever the kids if you're sitting in class and you're watching the screen, that's what they're gonna see at home. Screencast and an audio kind of thing. There are many, many others here. Let me see. I guess I should have had this link up and loading here. I, I found, I think, about 20. Yeah, or 12, sorry. Okay, so there's there's tons of others. And I can put this link. Well, you'll see it on the, on the slideshow here. So there's free ones. SketchUp, Avi Screen. Cam Studio, Copernicus for Macs, Jing Project, I've seen people use that. screencast o -Matic was the one that I talked about before. Wink. Uh, if you want to get a little higher end and buy something, uh, Adobe Captivate has something. All Capture, Hypercam, there are, you'll find something that works for you. Okay? This is how the kids, you'll, my own son, Minecraft player, right? He'll be online on YouTube looking at Minecraft videos that other people have sort of done, tutorials and stuff, that's how they do it with some type of software like this, right? Uh, any tutorial that you see where someone's working on a computer, you're doing a screencast. Uh, posting to YouTube. Um, if you have a YouTube account, you're set to go. Uh, YouTube, of course, is the same as Google Docs, Gmail. You may even have that type of account. Um, if you go to I like to use Chrome. If you go to YouTube and you've got a name up here, then you've got an account. Okay. I have I have Mr. Bennett's channel. Okay. Uh, you might want to consider different channels. For a number of years, I had one channel. All my school stuff was there, plus all my personal stuff when my kids are playing in their band somewhere or whatever, and I'm recording it and send it to grandma down in Arizona, it's the same channel. And I realized I kind of probably want to keep them separate. So I did a little bit of cleanup. It's easy enough to do. It took me a little while to figure out. But so here's Mr. Bennett's channel. And then if I switch my account to my own personal one, then you'll see my, uh, my own personal videos kind of thing. So easy enough to switch back and forth. You just have to remember to do it, that's all. Right? So try to keep my, uh, my school stuff and my personal stuff kind of separate kind of thing. Uh, YouTube does have a 15 minute limit, although you can increase that by verifying my cell phone. It's pretty easy. You just type in your cell number, um, they'll send you a text message, you click accept kind of thing, and uh, it just confirms that you're a real person uh, kind of thing, and then they will increase your limit. If you maintain a good track record for following copyright guidelines, then that increases as well. I've never had an issue with going over the limit. And I also find that most of the time, my videos are less than 15 minutes. Uh, maybe a few might be 16 or 17 kind of thing, but not not too bad at all. Uh, as long as you're not posting um, inappropriate material or copyright songs, YouTube, as much as you want, kind of thing. Okay, so to actually do it, I'll, I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the screenshots of how to do it, and then when I'm done the session and I click stop, then I'm actually going to do it again. So you're going to see it sort of both ways, kind of thing, okay? So you just click upload, and then you will, and uploads up here in the right-hand corner of the screen, and then you just uh, select the files to upload, browse to your file. If you want to do more than one, what I suggested with my colleague, the math, uh, math individual, I said, Ted, make all your lessons, do all your videos, and then we'll just upload them all at once, kind of thing, rather than going back and forth type of thing. And then I only had to be in the room for a few minutes while I was uploading, kind of thing. So you can upload as many as you want. 
Um, the only thing I don't like about YouTube is that it doesn't allow you to sort of put them in folders that we tend to, you know, we have our stuff arranged in folders. Um, you can set up playlists. You can use the different channels. I should have mentioned that as well. I thought I was going to actually. Uh, under the channels here, you could have like one channel for your social studies class, or one channel for your English class, or one channel for your math class, and have them separate that way. Not true folders, but certainly um, separated. So you browse to your file, and it literally goes in at home maybe 30 seconds on our, uh, on our pipe at home. Okay, click on the link. I just used one, a quick little video I had about a spinning marker that I had just to sort of create these screenshots. So that's why it says spinning marker. It'll show the uh, progress bar here, processing your video, and it gives you the link right away. Even before it's 100% completed, it will give you the link so you can sort of go and post it before it's actually done. Okay? Um, once it's done, you can click click on there, click on the link that it's created, and it will look like this. And it'll say, this video is currently being processed. Please check back in a few minutes. That's fine. You don't really need to check it. You can if you want, certainly. Then you go down to where it says share right here, and you can either use the link or the embed code. I like the embed code. It depends on where you're going to post it to. Um, just so that they're not bouncing from your site to YouTube, I use the embed code, but it really doesn't make any difference how to do that or whether or not you do that and then you can post to a class web page like Weebly some of our teachers at home are using that I use Schoology uh, you can post it to Twitter email Facebook create a QR code really the uh, the sky's the limit there um, for where you can post them uh, I've seen kids use them on their phone they'll pull their phone out of class get on put the headphones in and they're watching the video right there I've seen kids on field trips get their phone out, watch the video that way. So really, it's, uh, it's kind of unlimited. Um, you might want to consider a playlist. Uh, that's the way I've arranged my computer science ones. Groups the videos together. If you're thinking about a flipped classroom model, if you want to have, say, uh, a unit in math, um, fractions or what have you, if you want to put all your videos together, it basically is a playlist. Once video one is done, it automatically goes to video two and three and four, that type of thing. Consider that. And that's really all I've got to show you. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll post this and then I'll take questions. Okay, so I'm just going to show you here. So if you imagine a classroom full of kids, I've done my lesson on vector addition or what have you in physics class. All I do is just stop my video. 